the time the elephant died, immediately after that, the water table began to rise, and it rose to the point where the, the mud was preserved, and the elephant carcass was preserved, and it was covered by the black mat deposit. Um, I, I think I've probably said just about all I need to say about that. And, and just to summarize, we have a geological deposit, a marker bed that is spread across the North American continent and evidently, uh, and we'll hear a little bit more about that, I think, into uh, Europe. It is the case that it uh, has a, a relatively uh, precise radiocarbon date range of about 12,900 years for its initiation. <clears throat> it never has Clovis remains in it. It never has megafauna above it, and um, it, it's just an extraordinary finding in archaeology to have that kind of, of uh, clarity and that kind of, of definitive stratigraphic evidence. The, the words that uh, Van Tain uses are abrupt. Um, he, he runs through in this article, one, one last thing, he runs through in this article that he thinks the extinction and the uh, event that terminates the Pleistocene is, in his words, synchronous and instantaneous. And the um, uh, various things that have been proposed to explain that in the past include the overkill hypothesis, most famously associated with Paul Martin. Van Tains runs through the possibilities of overkill. And his, his quote here is that Martin's overkill hypothesis posits humans as the sole cause, but could they do it everywhere in the same instant? That's his rhetorical question regarding overkill. And the notable word here is instant. He's proposing that the megafauna and the end of the Pleistocene came in an instant. He runs through the possibility of climate change being the cause for the extinctions. But he doesn't think enough time elapsed, so he says, Lundelius and Graham invoke climate change, but this, like over overkill, would seem to require more time than the evidence for stratigraphic abruptness allows. Stratigraphically abrupt, Pleistocene comes to an end in an instant. Um, I, I find the language in here to be um, pretty remarkable in, in terms of what is, is being said about the nature now of what we think we know about the very beginnings of Basket Maker 1. And I want to also um, conclude here by, uh, finally conclude, I promised that several times now, but I'm, I'm finally going to conclude. Um, in this article, he says, therefore, this is just the beginning of scientific study to see if an ET event can be verified to explain the Rancho La Brea termination. And so that's what we're here today to talk about, and that is whether or not an ET event can be verified. And uh, I say, let the debate begin. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do now is, I think, start with the panel from, um, I'm sorry, from, from right to left. I want to give um, uh, Ted and Alan a chance to summarize, for those of you who might not have been able to attend the presentation last night, I want to give them a chance to summarize what they found, and then I want to uh, move down the table in order and, and have statements about the skepticism and the questions that remain about what they've proposed. So, um, would you like to start, Alan? Okay. I want to continue with a little bit about uh, Eloise because uh, Eloise is a good starting point for what we found. Some of the best markers and evidence for what we think is an ET impact came from very close to Eloise the mammoth. Now, one of the curious things about that is the footprints at Murray Springs do lead up to where Eloise was found and the black mat was actually pried from these footprints. There is no other stratum between the footprints and the mat. Um, for those of you that <clears throat> weren't there last night, uh, Van Sains asked an African elephant expert to take a look at the skeleton, and he concluded that because of the way the skeleton was articulated, that the animal cannot have been dead more than two weeks before the black mat formed on top of it. So very likely, Eloise was one of the last mammoths alive anywhere on the continent. <clears throat> And the curious thing about it is that at Murray Springs, we find 14 different markers that we think suggest this ET impact. That, of course, is the de debatable part. What's not debatable is that Eloise and all the mammoths disappeared. But at Murray Springs, in the footprint and on top of bones, uh, Eloise is gone, but there were other mammoths at Murray Springs. 
the top is stained black by the mat, and the bottom, which was still in the clothes sand, is unstained. When I tested those, the top of the bones are mildly radioactive and magnetic, and the bottom half is neither. And we find these markers absolutely draped over these bones. We find them right at the bottom of the black mat and this very thin millimeter layer between the level that the clothes people were walking on, and, including Eloise, and the black mat. So, so we have what's actually a beautiful datum for, uh, for that time. And for those of you or anyone that's working in the, the Clovis Horizon, with a $30 magnet and a bucket of water, you can find two of the 14 markers that we find there. And we found them at virtually every one of the 30 sites we've looked at from offshore California and the Channel Islands, all the way to Topper and South Carolina and on into Belgium and Germany. And, and where the black mat exists, not at every site, but where it does exist, we find these markers right at the bottom of it. So anyone with a magnet can go to a wall, find these peak and magnetic grains that have these little melted iron balls in them, magnetic spherules. And so uh, within a few minutes, if you have any doubt about the age of a site as an archeologist with a $30 magnet, chances are you can answer your question. Whether or not there's a map there, which is a, an obvious visual marker. So we'll be the first to admit that we don't know what happened. What we find are these enigmatic markers, one of which is diamonds. We find these tiny diamonds that are about the size of a coal virus. Some of them just recently were found are half a millimeter. That's the biggest we found. We we're finding those all across parts of two continents, and we find them only in this layer. They're not below it. We've looked. They're not above it. We've looked. They're only there. So while we don't know exactly what happened, like Van says, we know that something extraordinary happened. And the best explanation that we've come up with is an ET event. Well, frankly, we don't know what that was. We think it may have been a fragmented comet, but since no one's ever seen anything like that before, it's pretty hard to uh, come up with any definitive proof. But all the markers that we have point to an ET event, uh, but what we do know is that the animals, tens of millions of animals, went extinct right at that geologic instant. As he said, not a one of them has ever been found in the mat or above it. And this is tens of millions of animals, mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed tigers, giant sloths, short-faced bear, um, peccaries, giant beavers, all of those animals which were even in some of these woods around here 13,000 years ago, they're not here now. And so that's the real mystery. Uh, where did they go and why? And that layer tells us that uh, that was the end of them. And curiously, Clovis went through a major transition too. There are no Clovis points above that. The technology to make Folsom points and redstones and all the successor points is a different technology. And so anyone who looks at those points and knows how to make them says, yes, this is Clovis, that's Folsom, and they're not the same. So, so that's where we stand now. There's a lot we don't know, but there's a lot that we do know. And the hardest to explain is where did these diamonds come from? Uh, the one type of diamond that we found is called uh, Lonsdaleite. It's a hexagonal diamond. It's only known to occur in two places on this planet. It's either found in meteorites that fall or it's found in meteorite craters caused by the impact itself. And we've now found Lonsdaleite at three sites from offshore California and into Germany. So the real mystery is how did those diamonds get there? It takes extreme temperature, extreme pressure to make them, and none of those conditions are known to exist at the surface of the Earth. So that's where we stand today. And uh, Ted is more of our uh, impact expert, so he was uh, chief of exobiology at NASA for a fair amount of his career, latter part of his career. He's now retired at NEU. So I'm going to pass the baton to Ted. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. May I see a show of hands for those who did not attend last night's presentation? Uh, you're excused. <laughs> it makes my job simpler to summarize what happened last night. My goodness. <laughs> um, well, as Alan said, uh, we, we have these uh, wonderful markers, uh, and Vance Haynes and other uh, uh, climatologists, glaciologists, everyone has pointed to the fact